Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Trevor Burris. And I'm Aaron Powell. Joining us today is Virginia Postrel, an author, columnist, and speaker, and former editor of Reason Magazine. Her new book is The Fabric of Civilization, How Textiles Made the World. Welcome to Free Thoughts. Great to be with you. And I'd like to start with the question you asked in your afterward. Why textiles? Well, there, there are a couple of reasons. One is I'm very interested in things that are very important but overlooked. And in our time, textiles definitely fall into that category. Uh, they are everywhere. It's not just our clothes. It's our blankets. It's our sofa cushions. It's seat belts and duct tape and fire hoses. It's all kinds of things. They're everywhere. And it's a huge global industry and one that has had an enormous impact on human history, but we don't know about it. And we don't know about it because, as I say in the afterward, uh, we suffer textile amnesia because we enjoy textile abundance. So partly tracing where that abundance comes from gives us uh, not only insights into textiles, but insights into the history of innovation, into all different aspects of human history globally. So that's uh, that's one reason. And then a related reason is that I am interested in a lot of different things. That's one of the things that's hard to explain about what do you write about? I'm interested in economics and politics and culture and art and technology and textiles enables me to write about all those different things. What is a textile? What counts? Yes. Well, that's a, a good uh, question. I, for purposes of the book, do not include leather, which is sometimes classified as a textile. But I... Uh, include, I don't have a quick definition, but basically it is a something that is made out of thread. Well, that's not even true because there's such a thing as non-woven textiles, which I don't really talk about, but felt is the historical example. Nowadays, there are lots of different kinds of non-woven textiles. If you have a mask with a filter in it, the filter is probably a non-woven textile. And I don't write about those in the book, but that's not because they're not textiles. That's just because you can't write about everything. I don't write about carpets either and their textiles. But it's essentially a, you know, a floppy thing made out out of, uh, usually out of thread, but out of fiber of some sort. And throughout, I mean, your story, of course, is quite long, but it seems that we probably can't say for sure, but essentially every culture at some point developed this, it, it, it seems like. Pretty much every culture developed textiles. There are some people in Tasmania who perhaps didn't. And there are cultures that are very far north that were primarily fur and leather cultures because of climate reasons. But yes, they, textiles are something that human beings in general share. And many of the key inventions were invented multiple times around the world of uh, you know, ways to spin the basic invention of how to spin more than what you can put together by rubbing some fibers on your leg, on your thigh, that's how spinning sort of starts, is a stick with a weight at one end that uh, enables you to feed fiber onto it and set it spinning sort of like a top in the air or sometimes against a bowl and feed uh, the fiber on there and make string and make thread large quantities of it. And that was invented all over the world. It's called a drop spindle. And the little weight is called a spindle whorl. And there are thousands and thousands of them in drawers and museums that have been discovered all over the place. Uh, so that sort of technology it was invented all over the world. Another one that's even more surprising is indigo dyeing. So indigo is kind of the blue that's in your blue jeans. In your blue jeans, it's probably synthesized in a lab, but 
it was originally developed as a uh, a plant dye using many different plants. The the key chemical ingredient is found in different plants that are unrelated to each other. So depending on where you were in the world, you would use a different plant. And it's a very complicated chemical process because first you have to you know, have the plant and water and the, the enzymes in the plant to create a a certain kind of chemical, but then you have to add something else and then you have to transform it and then you get the blue, but the blue precipitates to the bottom and it won't dye your cloth. So then you have to change it to a different chemical that then dyes your cloth kind of a, a green as it comes out of the water and then it changes to blue in, in the air's oxygen. So it's a very complicated process and it was invented everywhere. I mean, we're using different plants. So the what we call indigo comes, as the name suggests, from India. But there was woad in Europe. There were forms of India in West Africa. There were forms uh, of indigo in West Africa. There were forms of indigo in uh, Southeast Asia and Japan and uh, Guatemala and the Americas in general. So, you know, it, it's really something that human beings share. Uh, and then there are other inventions that were only made once and spread by trade or conquest or some combination of the two. This process of turning thread, weaving it into textiles seems – so the idea of getting to thread, of I'm going to twist – I've got some fibers, I'm going to twist them together and lo and behold – it turns out it makes this longer thing that's stronger. It seems like something you could stumble across. Like you're just, you know, you're just messing around and you find that out. Weaving seems more counterintuitive, I suppose. And and so I'm curious if we know how that specifically was invented or what the early use cases were for woven fabric. Was it did we make clothes or so we don't know exactly how it was invented because it was invented maybe 10,000 years ago. And one of the things that's difficult about studying the distant past with textiles is that textiles have a bad habit of rotting and disappearing, and string does as well. Um, so there are only a few places in the world where we have truly ancient textiles, but fortunately we do have some. So we can kind of trace the likely path. So if you have string, and string is very, very old, a 50,000 year old string has been discovered of Neanderthal. It's literally made by Neanderthals. And as you say, that probably came about from people sort of messing around with plant fibers. Once you have string, you start doing things with it. And one of the things you start doing is making fishing nets and things with knots. And probably that is a path to creating something that's sort of like a plane, <laughs> if you will, as opposed to a line. Uh, the other thing that happens is you have people making baskets. And, and just recently, a very ancient basket was discovered in a cave in Israel, uh, which is the has been described in news accounts as the oldest woven basket. Uh, so containers may have been the sort of first use case rather than something that is sort of floppier. Uh, but we don't know for sure. And I suspect, I haven't seen enough detail, I suspect that that woven basket like many very ancient forms of woven cloth, like for example, in the book, I talk about a 6,200 year old piece of indigo dyed fabric from Peru, are technically not woven. They're what is called twined, where if you think about weaving uh, and think about like maybe how you did it with construction paper in kindergarten. <laughs> you you lift every other thread, warp thread, and you put something underneath it. Twining, you have two threads going across and you wrap one above the warp thread and one under it so that you have this kind of continual twisting. And that seems to have been invented first. Um, and in some ways, it's while I wouldn't call twining intuitive, it's a little more intuitive than the idea that you could have this fabric that would be held together just by friction with nothing resembling a knot. 
And the other thing is, although you don't have to, it is very helpful to invent something called heddles, which were invented in different parts of the world as well. And those are basically little string loops. Uh, nowadays, they would be metal, uh, probably on an industrial loom, but it's it adds a third dimension to the process. So you, you put a string loop around each uh, warp thread. Those are the ones that are held in tension. And then you can lit put a, like a stick through selected string loops and lift them all at once and then put your uh, your weft thread, the one that's going left to right or right to left, uh, through all at once. And that speeds up the process. So this whole invention of weaving is this constant addition of little hacks to the basic idea. And I I did learn to weave as part of the process of researching the book. And I got involved in weaving and working in hand weaving and working with Hand Weavers Guild here in LA. And, so, and weavers to this day are constantly coming up with little things to make their life easier um, and, you know, repurposing all sorts of weird, <laughs> weird office supplies or whatever to to make weaving easier. So I think that's kind of the history of it. Um, yeah, I heard a talk recently that the uh, in in Southeast Asia, the invention of a pedal to do a lot of this work as opposed to things with your hands might have had to do with uh, taxes being levied in cloth and people needing to produce more cloth to meet their tax burden. And so coming up with a, a form of speeding up the process. That kind of cumulative innovation, I, I also find it fascinating where we should, we can marvel at the airplane or something like that, but there's these things that we take for granted. I think it was Bill Bryson who had a line where he said, uh, call me obtuse, but you could stick me on a beach for a thousand years and I'll never look at the sand and then think, oh, glass. And I, <laughs> yes, I, I, right. and, and I think that about bread, you know, who the, the first crazy person to eat a lobster, right? Like that guy was a bold adventurer. And there's just like a lot of people. Very hungry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Very hungry. There's a lot of people in the story. So it kind of gets this like, diff like but the difference between like culture and like civilization, like how we accumulate these, yes, no this yeah. knowledge is just a huge part of the story. Like just so you said about indigo. Another one that, that often is cited for that is um, cassava. Like what you need to do to cassava to be able to eat it safely is an astounding <laughs> process. And how right, people come right. up with this is incredible. How did people come up with And how many people died along the way? Yeah. Yeah. And I actually, in the book, I, I write about indigo and I, I took an indigo dyeing workshop and talked to the, the guy there about like, how did anybody ever come up with this in the first place? And then I did a little experiment in my bathroom, uh, you know, with, with indigo leaves to see if I could kind of recreate the uh, primordial puddle, as, as, I, as I call it, which, because people did figure it out all around the world. And, and, you know, it got better over time and, and there was a lot of trial and error experimentation. And the theme of the uh, dye chapter is really the history of dyes shows both the power and the limitations of trial and error experimentation without a fundamental sort of scientific understanding of what's going on because people got pretty far with just using trial and error experimentation, partly because when you dye things, you can tell what the results are. It's not like, you know, medicine where uh, maybe it was what the uh, so-called doctor did. Uh, I mean, we still have this problem. Um, and maybe it was just some random result with dying, you can control things a lot better. Um, uh, but then when you actually start to have chemical science, you get a great leap forward in the 19th century where you can actually synthesize dyes in the lab. On that point, the, the status element of dye, um, in particular, Roman purple, uh, where, where did that come from? Or, I mean, where, well, how did they get that purple and, and why was well, it those such two a status? Yeah, <laughs> so, so those two questions are related. There was this ancient purple, sometimes called Tyrian purple, because it was uh, associated with the city of Tyre, was a major dye pro production site. And it came from several different species of snails, murex snails, that are found in the 
Mediterranean area. And they have a gland in them that secretes a purple substance. And I tell the story in the book of the efforts to recreate the process by an archaeologist named Deborah Rashilla, who's at Washington University in St. Louis. And she's an archaeologist who studies what are called faunal remains, which is basically old bones. She's the kind of person who can tell you by looking at the bones when people were raising sheep just for their milk and meat and when they started raising them for their wool. And she would see all these giant piles of old shells all around various excavation sites where dyeing ha- used to be done. And she wondered, you know, how many shell, how many sales did it take? And, and that sort of thing. So she decided to recreate it. And she and a, an assistant first went and they set traps, which are basically like little jugs, clay jugs. Um, they collected s- snails in a bay off of Crete. They also collected a lot of water and a lot of things that stung. And <laughs> this was the first step on the lesson that this is very hard and unpleasant and and somewhat and slightly dangerous. Uh, anyway, they got a lot of shells. They cracked them open, which was a trick in itself. Then they started scraping out the meat into little pots of water. And it was an extremely unpleasant process. First of all, it stank to high heavens. And far distant from them, there were some workers who were, you know, trying to eat lunch and they were complaining about it. Um, and back in the day, it, Tyre was famous as a rich city, but a place nobody wanted to go because it was so unpleasant because they didn't just have little you know, pots of dye like you'd have on your stove. They had these giant pits. Anyway, so they got the, uh, the dye in the pots. There were flies buzzing around, stinging them, horse flies. They finally got it. They produced a lot of really beautiful colors, uh, including the one that looked like the color of clotted blood, which was the one that was very valuable in ancient Rome, particularly on wool. Uh, it, it makes a very deep, intense color. It uses a lot of snails to make that on wool which was what a a toga would have been made out of. And it is a very long, involved, labor-intensive, and unpleasant process. And and that's probably why the dye was so expensive. And the prestige came from the expense. Um, And one of the things that is interesting about it is it's not just a stinky process of dyeing, which is also true of indigo. But unlike indigo, the stink stays. It stays on the cloth. And this is interesting because it's unpleasant, but it was a status marker because that was how you could tell that it was the real deal. This was not some vegetable dye substitute. Um, And Deborah says, you know, she has these 20-year-old samples that she did that have been washed in Tide and are still smelly. <laughs> so, so, and and there's ancient Roman poetry, satirical poems, you know, making fun of a rich woman who wears this stinky dye to cover her body odor and uh, lists uh, the smell of the the purple cloth in a long list of very unpleasant smells of various sorts. So, it's a it's a really interesting example. It is an attractive dye, but the status clearly isn't just from its beauty. Uh, it, it is something that says, I'm an important person. I have a lot of wealth. Uh, and you can tell because my clothes stick. Silk plays a pretty large role in the story that you tell. Maybe start with how silk is produced, because it's another one of these where if you, once you kind of know, you're like, how did anyone possibly come up with that right the legend is that the empress or the silk goddess or some you know legendary person dropped a silk cocoon into a cup of tea and the the uh, thread started to come out so silk is from silkworms which are the caterpillar of a particular kind of moth which uh, the technical name of is Bombyx mori, but it's sometimes just called mulberry silkworms. 
They are a completely domesticated species that cannot survive in the wild because human beings have altered them so much that they uh, no longer have the characteristics that would allow them to survive in the wild. So the first step is you have, well, you know, it's like anything, which came first, the chicken or the egg, but you have some silkworms. <laughs> the silkworms need to be fed mulberry leaves. So people uh, feed them this very specific kind of leaf and in, sophisticated silk operations historically they would chop the leaves up into small pieces to make them even better for the silkworms to be able to eat they raise them on bamboo trays uh, then when it comes time for the silkworms to spin their cocoons uh, people give them sticks to spin them on little little branches and everything has to be very temperature controlled uh, and you know, we're talking about places that are heated with charcoal burners, uh, uh, that sort of thing. Not, not today. I mean, today it's all very scientific and computerized and such. But the the silkworms spin their cocoons, which are about a little bit smaller than your thumb, little white cocoons. They've been bred to be very white because that makes the silk easier to to die. And right before the silkworms hatch, uh, most of the cocoons are heated to kill the insects inside so that they don't emerge and break the single strand that is the silk uh, filament that makes the cocoon. Some of them emerge because they got to have the next generation and they need some to you know, lay eggs and make more silkworms. Uh, the silk cocoons are put into warm water, which dissolves the kind of sticky substance that holds that long filament together into a little uh, ovoid uh, ball. And somebody, it's usually a woman, uh, there are different techniques depending on where you are. You can use her finger, in which case, her finger is all day in the hot water or a chopstick or a little brush, some kind of little thing, takes a strand off each cocoon, takes several strands. Uh, the most, the finest silk, it would be two and puts them together, joins them and they are reeled. It's the, the stage is called reeling onto uh, a, a large horizontal reel. And then usually there is, and then as she comes to the end of a cocoon, she's got to match it with the next stage. So this is instead of spinning, it's all coming out in one long filament, which can be very, very long, but eventually it does run out and you need to add on another cocoon. And then the next stage is usually you take a couple of those strands and you twist them together, which is called throwing. And then sometimes you twist those together and it, depending on how strong versus fine a silk you, you make. And it's a very sophisticated, very complicated, very precise process. Um, and this is why silk is a luxury. Uh, but as you mentioned, in part because it was a luxury, silk is where a lot of innovations occurred originally. Um, this is... The origins of the belt drive uh, were in a silk workshop probably about 2,500 years ago. And a belt drive is basically when you have a little wheel and a big wheel and you run uh, a belt around the two so that you can turn the, the big wheel once and the little wheel turns many times. And this is in all kinds of motors. Um, and it's in Italy uh, in the 16th and 17th century, there were a bunch of these big silk throwing factories. They were actually, they took everything from the taking, they went from the cocoons with the, the reeling all the way to the finished thread in a single site with hundreds of people working 24 uh, seven. I asked a historian, how did they light it? He said, with torches. I said, wasn't that dangerous? He said, yes. <laughs> but, and they have these two story machines, uh, all made of wood, water powered that uh, 
twisted the silk. It's it's amazing. There are uh, reconstructions and uh, restored versions uh, that you can go to in northern Italy. So you have a lot of this sort of thing. It's not mass. It doesn't create the Industrial Revolution the way learning how to spin cotton did. Uh, but silk does create a lot of innovations through the history of textiles. Yeah, I want to get into that because I did not know about this level of mechanization on silk in the neither 1600s. did I <laughs> and i mean you know if we're to be honest if we even to this day we do this with silkworms on some sort of industrial level which still seems really crazy if you actually think there's like huge factories there must be with cultivating worms and you know me mechanized but the the basic worm part you know can't be oh, replaced yeah. right um uh, but well but, well people are working on it you it, you know, they've now bioengineered yeast to secrete silk proteins that can be made into thread. It's not yet at commercial scale, but eventually there will be vegan silk. And, there we go. Uh, I guess vegans don't wear silk. I never thought about that. No, uh, no they don't. No. So, uh, and, and Stella McCartney is very excited. Yeah. So, I mean, the tr that's literally true. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the Industrial Revolution, this is where, you know, we have Deirdre McCloskey's great enrichment and, and this idea of, of cotton in particular. So in that sense, set the stage uh, first with the, the nature of cotton production in the 18th century in England, because there was also some laws against certain type of cotton. And then, and then the, who, who are these people who start, you know, coming up with these absolutely game changing inventions? Yeah. So this is, so there are many threads, um, no pun intended, but they're unavoidable in this story. So let's start with thread. Uh, we, when we think of thread, we think of sewing thread. When we think of yarn, we think of something that's kind of fat and fluffy and maybe you knit sweaters from it. Uh, I use the term the two terms interchangeably in the industry, people tend to use the word yarn for anything you make fabric out of. Uh, and it takes an enormous amount of yarn to make anything. Uh, if you take the denim in a pair of blue jeans, there is six miles of yarn in that fabric. Um, and before the Industrial Revolution, it took a tremendous amount of time to make any amount of yarn. So before the Industrial Revolution, using the fastest uh, cotton spinning skills and technology in the world, which would have been Indian spinners using the charka, um, it would have taken about 100 hours to spin enough to make a pair of blue jeans. So 100 hours for one pair of pants is a lot of time. And that doesn't include the weaving or dyeing or, or, or the preparing the cotton, ginning it, uh, cleaning it, all of that sort of thing. So this is the state of the world before the Industrial Revolution, the late 18th century. Uh, you have textiles as a major industry in Britain, as, as well as other places, including India. Um, and you have, we have records of the production of woolen textiles in Great Britain in the late uh, 18th century, where it took 20 to 30 spinners to keep one weaver occupied, and they weren't always able to produce enough. So you have a shortage of thread. So that's one piece of the puzzle is regardless of what kind of thread it could be wool it could be linen it could be uh cotton um it was in short supply but just because it takes so much to make anything and it was so labor intensive the other piece of the puzzle is uh indian cotton prints which hit europe beginning in the 16th century but really in the 17th century they were a revolution uh, because first of all the cotton cloth itself was this wonderful lightweight uh, finely spun cotton cloth um, cotton was known in Europe but it was not a major uh, fabric um, and it's cotton is difficult to dye it's much easier to dye protein of 
fibers than cellulose fibers. And Indian dyers had achieved amazing results on cotton. They had created colors that were color fast, even when washed. And they had also developed printing and painting technology so that you could have designs like flowers or, uh, or you know, whatever, geometric designs on your cloth, which was not known in Europe. In Europe, uh, if you had a design, it was either woven in, which was extremely complicated and uh, expensive, or it was embroidered, which required uh, silk floss, which was also expensive. So basically, you're in a world of stripes and checks, which can be easily woven in uh, or, or solid colors. Suddenly, you have these Indian cottons. They're super comfortable. They're super washable. And they have all these different design possibilities. And Indians being good uh, business people who had a lot of tra uh, a lot of experience trading with Southeast Asia and developing special Southeast Asian designs for say the Malaysian markets they did the same with Europe Europeans wanted their uh, textiles to have light colored backgrounds with designs that stood out as opposed to an all over design which was the traditional Indian way of doing things so that's what these entrepreneurs uh, in in the Indian textile trade developed so you have this revolutionary cloth and one of the re one of the reactions to it is oh no no we don't want that it's a threat to our existing industries and this took different forms now, now this is all complicated by the fact that the east indian companies that were bringing this cloth into europe the british east indian the Eng British East India Company, the Dutch East India Company, and the French East India Company were all sort of quasi-governmental. Uh, so they didn't want to stamp them out. But on the other hand, they didn't want to let them in either. And different countries had different process, different approaches. So the Dutch basically had a free market. They let the cloth come in and that's why if you want to see good examples, the Rijksmuseum has great things on their website. You can look at that. Uh, the British banned the import of Indian uh, cotton prints into the mother country, into Great Britain proper, but they allowed them in the colonies. And so the British textile industry in Britain was making quote unquote cottons that really had linen used as the warp threads, which are the ones that are under tension and need to be really strong because they weren't able to produce strong enough cotton thread. So that's in France, they treated calicos the way we treat, these are called calicos, uh, the way we treat cocaine. And it was not just the prints themselves. Uh, it was any kind of print, even if it wasn't from India. It was any kind of cotton. Uh, they just banned everything. And it, it was very criminal. French. It seems very French. It was very <laughs> French. Yeah, it was very French. And that's because while in Britain, the the rival industry was sort of the wool industry and the textile industry uh, developed its own alternatives. In France, the industry that was being protected was really silk. Um, and so they wanted to keep out everything. And for 73 years, uh, France treated cotton, <laughs> uh, cotton fabric, the way we treat cocaine. I mean, you could, and it was very much, uh, also, I, I say sometimes say maybe it's the way we treat cocaine in the eighties, because it's not like people stop wearing them. I mean, people were wearing these things to court. Uh, it, it was sort of blatant and then every now and then there would be a crackdown and trafficker, they would try to get the traffickers and they would send people to the galleys and they would even execute people uh, who are major traffickers. And sometimes they would just, you know, look in people's windows and haul them off to jail because they had a chair with the wrong kind of print. Um, so this went on eventually, uh, partly because of the influence of some early uh, classical liberal writers who argued that this was not just ineffectual, but also unjust uh, to punish people in the, the, these grievous ways for just buying and selling. Um, it was repealed and replaced with a 25% tax, which was a huge tax, but 
smuggling continued and once it was in the country you couldn't tell the difference between smuggled and unsmuggled uh, calicos so you're in this world so to put the two pieces together um uh, in the british textile industry and i'm here basically taking the theory that is promulgated by a historian named john styles there are different stories of how the industrial revolution uh happened with textiles but this is my the one that i think is the most convincing uh the british textile industry wanted a piece of the american market they wanted to be able to sell cottons in the colonies and this is not just what's now the us and canada but also the caribbean so warm climates where they were very much uh, desired and their uh their substitutes weren't as popular there so they wanted a way to spin good cotton thread that could compete with the indian thread and that led to ways of looking at mechanization which ultimately through a series there were a series of innovations that sort of came together that produced these uh spinning mills uh in no northern uh england in the late say 1780-ish so the the late 18th century um and they were also used for uh the cotton thread was also used for making stockings which was a big uh industry uh sort of proto proto industry because there were these things called um stocking frames that were it was sort of like a loom but but for for knitting um uh, and people could make stockings and and in their uh homes or small workshops so there was already a pretty good little industry going cottage industry and using cotton was very popular uh one of the early uses of of cotton thread for that as well what role does gender play in all of this because when we when you look around right now at least in you know in western countries it feels like textiles and yarn and thread are like those are part of like those are the hobbies women are into as we think about it knitting and sewing and so on and we tend to think of these as like the the weavers and whatnot but then i was struck when you, you mentioned at the beginning like you're excluding leather from all this but when you look around at like the leather industry like i was on the horween leather website a week or so ago for random reasons and it's all these like burly dudes you know with like big tools and and so i just wondered like is that is there something to that if so why and is it universal so it's complicated <laughs> um and i i tend to think about this history as uh you know there's a warp and a weft we talk about men's history and women's history you can't there's really just human history that's the fabric and you, if you take away one or the other you miss the whole in looking specifically at textiles the one thing that seems to be universally a female activity is spinning um and there are theories about oh well it's because you can multitask you can spin and while you're watching the kids or the sheep or cooking or whatever and that's true except that why wouldn't male shepherds spin you know it, um so i tend to think that it probably has more to do with the fact that little girls develop fine motor coordination earlier than little boys and especially to be a very good spinner like you know these indians on the charco or like most women spinning historically uh, you have to start really early i mean i talk in the book about aztec girls being trained to spin starting when they were 4 and the various punishments that their mothers used if they didn't do a good job uh and you know trying to teach a 4 year old boy to spin would be even harder um and you just think about little boy's handwriting not that my hair is not in vigorously because he has a uh, although he has i think about like girl, my brother like... my brother had fabulous handwriting and my handwriting to this day is terrible so you know there are individual differences but i tend to think that that's the reason so spinning is historically pretty much universally female now there are men today uh, including uh in doing traditional like i took a spinning workshop with andy and weavers and my 
my instructor was a man. That's, but that's because it's, you know, the 21st century. And so he may be doing it in the traditional context, but he's still a modern person. Um, weaving, it depends. So in, in English, in English, there's an old saying when Adam delved and uh, Eve span or spun, uh, uh, who then was the gentleman. And this was the division of labor between men and women. You know, men were digging in the dirt and women were spinning. In China, the phrase is uh, men till women spin. Now, in truth, women worked in the fields until too. Uh, women weave, rather. So in China, weaving was female. In Europe, it was uh, heavily male. I say heavily because the guilds tr generally tried to restrict it to men, and they generally failed. But uh, if, if only because people's widows and their daughters would uh, would weave. But um, it depends. And there are places in West Africa where women weave on one kind of loom and men weave on a different kind of loom traditionally. So uh, weaving, dyeing, uh, knitting with, especially with uh, something like the stocking frame, uh, those things all vary. They vary with the, the time and place and the technology. Um, so why do we associate it with women so much? I think it's just because it has been a larger part of women's lives than of men's lives. So it's not that men didn't participate in textile production and textile trade. It's that women did, it, it was like a smaller percentage of their total lives. And so then when you get into uh, our era where you're talking about something that is where these handcrafts are hobbies as opposed to uh, ways of making a living, women are more likely to take it up. I mean, I, I mentioned I'm in a weaver's guild, which is not a <laughs> restraint of trade guild, it's just a club. And, you know, we have s several active male members, but that's several in a group of, you know, 150 Two hundred people, you know. So it's it's a small percentage uh, of our membership. Maybe it may be as much as ten percent, and that's pretty typical. On the other hand, if you go to a modern textile industry conference, you know where you're dealing with industrial production, uh, partly because of where that industrial production takes place today, uh, a lot of the participants will be. It'll be heavily. Well, male. The, the other interesting thing um, about that, though, on the industrial side, is. If you go to Lowell, Massachusetts, uh, you'll you'll see the museum of what was, I think, maybe the biggest textile or cotton textile producing, it, one of the biggest for a period of time. And it was almost all worked by women um, who, who, you know, we talk about, you know, the, the, the pains of wage, you know, low wage sweat stop, sweatshops or something like this, which of course is, is a product of wealth. But, you know, these women, this, they work six days a week um, and they work 10 hours, 12 hours a day. But that was a massive liberation compared to farming, which if you think about it, really sucks. <laughs> and so they- Yeah, and right. They I mean, people and, forget <laughs> how bad farming was and, and it was- and it was very bad for women. It was sort of talk about the second shift. Uh, oh, farm women worked, you know, especially. I mean, farm women still work. Farmers still work hard, but now they have a lot of machines to help them. And but, as kids, yeah. Um, so, but how does that yeah, story go right, around the right. world? Where it seems that the textile right. industry is like a leading thing. It kind of goes. It's part of like a, being a developing nation, which also becomes yeah. part of women's liberation to some extent. Right. Right. Yeah. It's it. it in many places, that is the, the story. Um, yes, so what you have in the U.S. and in uh, New England uh, first and also in northern England uh, in the U.K. Uh, and you, all, you also see it in Asia, uh, in East Asia. It's actually different in South Asia. Um, is a lot of teenagers, essentially. So 
girls, women, <laughs> what are they? Um, coming off of farms and going to work in textile mills as a way of getting cash income. And it is a liberating experience in the sense that these are women who were not financially independent of their families in any way before that. Um, they had no income or wealth really of their own. Um, and so they have cash income, which in many cases they give back to their families or uh, parts of it. Uh, but it, it gives them a sense of liberation. And also, you know, these working conditions were bad. I mean, they were not pleasant and the wages were not high. Um, and they also become labor activists, which gets them, gives them a political role, a public role, which becomes, you know, as you get closer and closer to the 20th century, becomes more and more a factor in women's political liberation as, as well. Uh, so the, the, this transformation has a big effect on, on women. Um, it is different in South Asia, in places uh, like Northern India. Uh, even today, if you go into textile mills, they are predominantly male. Uh, and that's because there is a strong cultural uh, well, it, 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 it's because people are more worried about their women being out of the house than because uh, then they want the money. I mean, <laughs> I mean, people didn't want their women out of the house anywhere, especially like say in East Asia either, but they wanted the money more. So it's a, uh, it's a tension. A, a common narrative across a lot of different industries, but I think it certainly shows up in, um, in particular clothing now, and maybe it's like part of the, like the rise of Etsy is part of this too, is that mass production and capitalism has led to a decline in quality. We have like fast fashion now instead of, you know, like really high quality goods. Is that the case in the textile industry? Like are textiles now less well made than they used to be, less robust, fall apart quicker, more disposable? That's a good question. I I don't think I would say that textiles are less well made. There is much more polyester used, and the polyester is much better than it used to be. Um, uh, there, the, the improvements in polyester since the you know 1970s are extraordinary and not very well remarked. Partly because a lot of people I think don't realize that things like fleece and microfiber are polyester. Bring me a coat um, of your finest polyester is not something you hear yes, very right, often, but it's right, possible. Exactly. Yeah. And I was in, when I was in doing research in India, I went to a sari factory uh, that was all making polyester saris, which are, you know, sold mass market saris of, uh, and for poor women would be much easier to take care of. Um, I think that apparel is, more poorly made at, at this moment uh, because there has been this emphasis on fast fashion and disposable apparel that you just wear a couple times and then get rid of. Um, but I don't think it's because the component textiles are worse. Um, and, and my uh, friend Adam Minter has a great uh, book called Second Hand, which is about the worldwide secondhand trade in goods, including apparel. And one of the things he, he does point out is that if you go to a place like Goodwill uh, and you talk to somebody who's been in that business for you know, a length of time, they say that the stuff they get is worse and they have to get rid of more of it because it is not as well made. But it's not the textiles. It's the, the fabrication of them into clothes. So if someone is a, a good free market believer, um, you know, what, what is, what is your story you telling your book, you know, have to say to the, the person who's a capitalist free market believer, uh, is it, is it a story that endorses th those principles? Well, I think it's, it's complicated. So yes, I mean, I generally in that category, and if you read the future and its enemies, that's kind of how I, how I think about the world. And you definitely see that and you definitely see, 
the story of uh, of people doing things that are not necessarily expected uh, that wouldn't be in anybody's plan, uh, central plan, uh, even in places where it seems like the, the centralized planning, like Colbert's um, uh, France, uh, is doing something good that is trying to spread best practices in the dye industry. Uh, they run into contradictions because they also want to encourage innovation in the dye industry. Well, if you're only, if you're only doing the same thing, you're not going to innovate. So how do you how do you square that circle? Um, it's complicated. There are aspects of the story that are very much uh, not free market or not classical liberal at all. Um, and some of that is contested nowadays. So for example, you hear the claim that, you know, we wouldn't have had the industrial revolution. We wouldn't have had these cotton, all this cotton, if it hadn't been for American slavery. And that historically, you know, unless we go back in a time machine and do it a different way, uh, we can't know for sure. I th think it's pretty convincing that we could have had all of those things with uh, a different type of uh, production structure. Uh, but it probably sped things up a little bit the, the uh, because people could move slaves uh, uh, against their will, uh, large, long distances. Um, and so they could settle the cotton frontier faster than if it had been done with immigration or, you know, migration, uh, the way the wheat frontier or the corn frontier was, was uh, settled. And by the way, slaves were used to w raise wheat in Virginia and places like that. Uh, so it's, it's not just a, um, cotton story. Um, so th this is all very contested, but I think that, yes, it, it, we, we have this abundance because, you know, Deirdre is right, because people were allowed to experiment and make, uh, make money by coming up with new and better ways to make textiles and to make, um, uh, things like, dyes that are related to textiles. Um, and the the other thing we haven't talked much about it, that actually plays a fairly large role in the book, and it has a, a complete chapter devoted to it, is t trade, exchange, commerce, uh, which whether you fit that into free markets or not, is certainly markets. Um, and it, it the textile trade is hugely influential throughout history. And often at the both at the center and the margins of society that is it's at the center in the sense that it's the wealth generating central uh, activity uh, uh, economic activity or after agriculture the central activity but it's often at the margins because say in china or in japan especially sort of confucianist societies it's considered a lesser activity uh and in I talk about sumptuary laws and ways of trying to uh, minimize the upward mobility of merchants, um, that sort of thing. But a lot of innovation comes out of that. And it's not just directly economic innovation. Uh, it's, uh, it's literacy, it's bookkeeping, it's the spread of Arabic numbers, it's mail service, all these kinds of things that long distance traders need came out of trading textiles. Thank you for listening. If you enjoy Free Thoughts, make sure to rate and review us in Apple Podcasts or in your favorite podcast app. Free Thoughts is produced by Landry Ayers. If you'd like to learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.